Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mehmet Sayar. Uh, I'm from the uh, College of Engineering. I have a double appointment there. I'm both in the Mechanical Engineering Department and also in the Chemical and Biological Engineering Department. Um, maybe I will also continue talking about anxiety, but this time <laughs> anxiety and uh, fear will be for the molecules. We will change the scale of it. Um, so what I would like to tell you about today is uh, part of my work. Uh, this is just a summary slide for what we are trying to do in my group. So we are looking at basically biomolecules, uh, whether it be DNA or uh, proteins or peptide-like molecules. Uh, at a fundamental level, we are trying to understand why do the, these molecules behave uh, the way they do. So for example, the DNA molecule, it has this famous double helical structure, as you know and it is uh, really nicely compactly packed inside the cell. So uh, part of the research that we are trying to conduct in my research group is trying to understand how does this compaction take place, how come the DNA molecules uh, compacted into such a small environment, and if we want to read the genetic information there, for example, how would you actually go about around it? Uh, we have also some uh, work uh, that we are conducting on trying to understand the material properties of such uh, biomolecules. Uh, and today, in particular, what I, will, I would like to talk to you about is uh, proteins and peptides. How come do they behave their function? So this is one of the uh, very nice examples of uh, proteins. This is an alpha hemolysing protein. Um, so these are actually made out of atoms, but uh, in this cartoon representation, we just see what is called as the secondary structure uh, of these proteins. So in particular, this one, we see that uh, there are lots of beta sheet formations. So you see these arrow-like stripes, which are called as the beta sheets. It, this particular structure is actually made out of seven different building blocks. They are all identical, and somehow, in the cell membrane, these seven different molecules, if I were to stretch them and put them in a, a sequence, they are really long chains made out of amino acids, what we call as amino acids. And somehow, in the cell membrane, they can really fold and acquire this uh, shape, mushroom-like shape. So on the left, you see the top view, and on the right, you see the side view, uh, so that this whole assembly is actually embedded inside the cell membrane. And this is actually a killer. It's a cell killer, uh, basically because of that pore structure that you see in the top view, so that once this thing is embedded into the cell membrane, now uh, material uh, that can actually cause the uh, death of the cell can actually go inside the cell. What I would like to understand is, OK, so these uh, proteins are made out of 20 different amino acids. So we know the chemical formula for these. and. Uh, the nature, what it does is we have these different sequences uh, in every one of these proteins. And depending on the sequence, they can actually adopt different shapes. So for example, in this case, we, have, we see this mushroom-like shape uh, forming. So we would like to actually understand how come this happens. And the reason we are of these colors. Uh, the colors are basically, the colors are uh, specifying the colors are specifying the different uh, monomers. So as I said, there are seven different molecules in this structure where the, each one is colored in a different way. Okay. They are all identical. They all have the identical sequence. And the nice thing is that they are separate molecules, but somehow on their own or with the uh, help of the surrounding effects, I will try to talk about that. Do they really look like stripes? No, no, actually, these are uh, made out of atoms, of course, but this, uh, this is a cartoon, what is called as a cartoon representation. Well, why you know, do you represent them with stripes? Uh, in order to simplify the understanding of these molecules, how do they behave? So the stripes basically tell us that they are not really randomly collapsing on top of each other, but rather they make actually very regular structures. For example, the stripes, whenever you see the stripes, there are actually hydrogen bonds between those stripes so that that corresponds actually what is called as a secondary structure. So the, this is one of the fundamental elements in, that is seen in proteins. Uh, the second one is the alpha helical motif, which I will also try to explain in the upcoming slides. So why are we interested in this? Well, this is uh, the Times cover of Times magazine from year 2000, actually. It's rather old by now. 
uh, Alzheimer's and diseases like these are basically caused by uh, dysfunctioning of proteins that are inherent in our bodies. So on the right hand side, for example, you see one of these mechanisms. On the top left corner, the blue ones, are the individual proteins that actually exist in our bodies. And these things are, these proteins are not really stable quantities, but they are in a dynamic stable equilibrium. So that they actually fluctuate around their equilibrium conformation, and sometimes they actually unfold and then refold during their lifetimes. So what is happening in the case of Alzheimer's is that as they go about their life uh, folding and unfolding many times maybe, uh, in some cases they form uh, some uh, monomeric aggregates and these are actually uh, stable in the cell and they don't cause any harm. But in certain cases they start forming what are called as amyloid precursors and as a result of these amyloid precursors we see formation of fibrillar structures, which essentially lead to the uh, death of the uh, neurons, and which causes the Alzheimer's disease. And the other motivation that we have is, if we somehow learn the rules of the game, so if I kn know what kind of sequence falls into what kind of structure, I can actually use this mechanism in order to co create some novel materials. Uh, this is an example from uh, Northwestern and uh, Stoops group. Uh, so what they have done is these fibers that you see on the left are actually self-assembled structures of very small peptide-like molecules. And they have shown that actually by using this uh, gel-like structure, you can actually heal. Uh, they, they used it uh, on a mice, actually. Uh, you can read it from there uh, so that uh, the liquid material developed by somehow Stoops group contains molecules that self-assemble into nanofibers, which act as a scaffold on which nerve fibers grow. So we can actually use these kinds of materials as biomaterials to heal ourselves or uh, other uses. Now, what I would like to do is go to the really basics. So th these molecules that I have shown you are still uh, relatively large molecules, so we cannot really study them atom by atom. Rather than doing that, let's try to go to really model structures where we can actually simulate these structures and try to get an understanding of their physical behavior and also their conformational behavior with the hope that we can hopefully uh, control their behavior, how do they assemble, and under what kind of conditions do they assemble. Now, the first question I'm going to ask is, what actually determines the conformation of a protein? So we have seen this mushroom-shaped aggregate, for example. Why do, did that sequence, that particular sequence, fold into a mushroom-shaped structure? I want to understand this behavior. So the central dogma was that if you know the protein sequence, then you should be, hopefully, uh, at one point, if we acquire enough information about the system, we should be able to predict what kind of final structure we are going to have. But later on, people also started to realize that it's not just the sequence of the protein, but you have to also take into account the water molecules, or for example, the ions in the solution. And in addition to this, we have many interfaces in the cell environment. And today, what I would like to focus on is basically these interfaces. I will divide them into two. One of them I will call as macroscopic interfaces, like uh, if you have a cup full of water, the top part, the air-water interface, for example. And the second kind of interfaces are what I will call as nano-interfaces. These are actually interfaces that are formed by other surrounding molecules. So let's take a look at one of these cases. So this is a very, very short peptide. It is made out of amino acids. You can actually see the sequence. So those letters at the top actually stand for the type of the amino acids that we have. Uh, I also put down the signs, the charged molecules, the charged amino acids there are also labeled there, as you can see. Um, on the left-hand side of the sequence, you mostly see positively charged amino acids. And on the right-hand side, you mostly see negatively charged amino acids. And the letters or the amino acids are arranged in such a way that uh, the red ones and the black ones are mostly water-loving, hydrophobic, hydrophilic uh, residues, 
whereas the other ones, the green ones, are actually hydrophobic residues so that they don't want to be really in a water environment. So they want to somehow get out of water environment. So we kind of create a frustrated molecule. So part of the molecule wants to be in water and part of the molecule wants to get out of water. Um, so what I will show you is, first I will show you the behavior of this kind of molecule in the presence of what I call as a macroscopic interface, air-water interface. And then we are going to look at what happens if this molecule is alone in bulk water. So this is an air-water interface simulation. So the bottom part is water. I, I'm hiding the water molecules. And the top part is actually air. And that blue layer there represents the air-water interface. As you can see, the molecule, as soon as I started the simulation, it goes to the interface. And after it goes to the interface, the blue residues there are representing the hydrophobic residues so that they, like, they don't want to be in water, so they want to get out of water. And the purple ones are the ones that are hydrophilic. So as I said, the double nature of these different kinds of residues leads to a partitioning of the molecule at the interface. But not only that, I use this color uh, stripe representation once again. Uh, this is the same motif that we have seen in the first uh, protein structure that I showed. Uh, there, by formation of hydrogen bonds between those two yellow stripes, you actually form what is called as a beta hairpin. So what we have seen is basically, when I present this molecule with a macroscopic interface, air-water interface, the molecule is strongly forced towards the interface. And at the interface, it's not just partitioning the hydrophobic and hydrophilic ones, but it also, the interface also enforces some sort of a structure on top of the molecule. It makes the conformation, this beta hairpin conformation, much more stable. As opposed to this, if I were to look at the same molecule in bulk water, it looks like on the left hand side. So I still see somewhat of a shape, the beta hairpin like shape. But if you look at the distribution of the purple and the blue residues, there you see that they are actually mixed. They are not really separated from each other. So the molecule is actually in a frustrated state so that it doesn't really stay always like this, but it goes to many different states, just like the way we have imagined. It goes to an unfolded state, and maybe it falls back to this state, and sometimes it also acquires some other secondary kind of structures. But if I have a macroscopic air-water interface, as you can see on the right-hand side, one of the snapshots, the molecule not only correctly orders this hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues so that the blue ones point, are pointing towards the air and the purple ones, the hydrophilic ones, are pointing towards the water, but it also adopts a very stable secondary structure. The beta hairpin structure is permanently there once it adsorbs to the interface. Okay, so in this slide I'm showing what kind of changes do we see there. Actually, pretty much we have talked about many of these. What is important is maybe we can talk about the uh, graph at the bottom. So the red color that you see here is a signature of that formation of the beta hairpin structure. And as you can see, the formation of the secondary structure actually happens simultaneous with the adsorption of the molecule to the air-water interface. So in a sense, we can say that uh, we were asking what exactly determines the conformation of a peptide molecule. Uh, it was known that the, secondary, the sequence of the molecule is very important. So what kind of amino acids make up this molecule? That is very important. But that's not sufficient. Actually, the environment that the molecule is in plays a major role there. As you can see, from many different conformations in bulk water, if you present this molecule with an air-water interface, it suddenly adapts a single conformation, which is the beta hairpin conformation for this particular molecule. Now, we can actually measure how much does the molecule want to be at the surface. We can measure the adsorption-free energy, basically, to the surface, so which is a measure of how strongly is the molecule attracted towards the interface. Um, and if, when we do this, what we basically see is that the secondary structure formation at the interface actually 
plays a major role in terms of the absorption free energy. For structures where we don't see any secondary structure formation, open adsorption to the interface, we see a linear behavior in terms of the change as a function of the number of amino acid residues in the structure. But when we have a secondary structure change, we see that this dramatically uh, destroys this linear behavior and the molecule's behavior becomes much more complicated uh, as we will see what if there is some competition from other surrounding it's, molecules. It's, it's uh, this is the integral over, uh, sorry. Okay. So basically we are integrating over this graph on the left hand side. We are trying to calculate the work done basically. When, so the zero there represents the center of the water, air water slab. It's a line integral. It's a line integral. Well, basically I have this potential energy that we calculate. Right? So what we are doing is, suppose this is the air water slab, this is the slab. I start the molecule from the center of this slab and then I slowly pull it towards the interface. And I, in a sense, I calculate the work done. Uh, the potential energy surface looks like this and by integrating that we can actually calculate the free energy of adsorption. Now, we talked about uh, different kinds of secondary structural motifs. So the example, the first example I showed you was for a beta hairpin structure. The, the next structure I want to show you is an alpha helical motif, which is another common motif in, uh, found in proteins. And in this case, the model peptide sequence is very, very simple. It's made out of just two different kinds of residues. L and K, L stands for leucine, that's another hydrophobic residue, and K stands for lysine, which is a hydrophilic residue. So once again, we create a double-natured molecule, which we call as an amphiphilic molecule. It, some part of the molecule likes water, and the other part, the rest of the molecule, likes uh, the air or hydrophobic surfaces. And we see a very similar behavior also in this case. So, the, these are called DSSP plots. So what is basically plotted in these graphs is on the y-axis we have the number of residues along the molecule and for each one of the residues we plot what kind of conformation is the uh, molecule in. So the available choices are it can be in a coil-like structure or it can be bent, turn, alpha helix or the five helix or the three helix, these kinds of different structures. Um, at the top, what I'm showing you is the behavior of the molecule in bulk water. So basically what we see is that it, we start the molecule as an alpha helical molecule, just as depicted on the left hand side. But the molecule doesn't seem to really be stable. It goes to what we call as a half helix. So half of the molecule goes to alpha helical, but the other half closes the hydrophobic part of the surface of the molecule. But then also the same molecule also shows some beta sheet-like structure, the beta hairpin-like structure, or the random coil structure. These are all different conformations that are acquired by exactly the same molecule. So in a sense, the molecule is uh, anxious a little bit, so it's uh, frustrated really in solution, so that it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know which conformation to pick. <laughs> but once again, when we present the molecule with an air-water interface, we see that it's all blue. Blue means it adapted the alpha helical sequence. And once again, we see the signature of the uh, amphiphilic nature of this molecule. The hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues separate, and the molecule, all of a sudden, uh, with the influence of this microscopic interface, it actually adapts only a single uh, secondary structure. OK, so now we can draw some conclusions about the microscopic interface. Basically, what we see is that there is a strong adsorption free energy. So it's uh, the going to the interface is rather favorable for these amphiphilic molecules. And the second thing that I want to emphasize is that we see a shift in population dynamics. So if I consider the conformational space of the molecule, in the conformational space, there are all sorts of these structures. So it can adapt the alpha helix, the beta hairpin, or other coil-like structures. But when I 
present the molecule with an air-water interface, suddenly the probability that the molecule will be in any of these other structures are eliminated, but the molecule is enforced to be in this alpha helical state. Now, in the cell environment, we, we have some uh, microscopic interfaces, but many of the interfaces that the molecule is actually uh, facing are, called, uh, uh, are much smaller in scale. So we can maybe call these as nano-interfaces that are made up of other molecules. So what, how do these molecules behave in such situations? Now, in this movie, what I'm showing you is the same molecule, the KL molecule. And I have now two of these molecules. We centered one of them in the center. And you can see that the conformation of that molecule is changing because of fluctuations in water environment. And the second one is slowly pulled towards the central one. Now, once again, now uh, when they are not in contact, they don't really feel each other, so they adopt different conformations. But as you can see, as they are coming closer and closer, they start interacting by extending their arms in a sense. You want to look at it that way. And eventually when they will really come into contact. Okay, this movie was a little bit longer than I expected. But, uh, there we go. Now you can see that the uh, white ones, the white side chains there, they are the hydrophobic ones. They want to shield themselves away from the water. And the blue ones are the hydrophilic ones. Once again, those are the ones that want to be actually in water environment. So you can see that even two molecules can actually act with respect to each other as interfaces. So that in the absence of an interface, the molecule chooses among many different conformations. It can adapt alpha helix or beta sheet or whatever structure it wants to. But in the presence of even another molecule, this population distribution is significantly altered. So that at the end of the movie, basically when the molecules are really in contact, both of them acquire this alpha helical state and remain there for the remainings of the time. And this is not just for uh, two molecules, but okay, <coughs> let's first discuss what is happening in bulk water. So this is the angle between these two alpha helices. Let's suppose that I fit an ang a vector along the axis of each one of these alpha helices. And I basically measure the angle between these alpha helices versus the distance between the center of mass of these molecules. The bright spot that you see on the left top part shows that there is actually one single preferred orientation for these molecules. They just want to stick uh, to each other. And we can actually see that from the red curve on the right hand side that shows the depth of that curve basically shows us how strongly do these molecules attract each other. This is in bulk water. If we do the same thing, if I put two molecules at the interface, now let's see what happens. Instead of a single preferred orientation, now I actually have many spots, as you can see on the lower left side. And those different spots actually correspond to the uh, arrangements that we see on the right hand side. So they don't want to be perfectly aligned, but they are uh, mostly, the most preferred structure is actually the one on the right top part. So we see that when I combine these two effects, so when I put these two molecules at the air-water interface, all of a sudden, the interaction between them is also changing. So we see a competition between the macroscopic interface versus the nano-interface that, that exists between these molecules. So do the red arm touch the red arm and the blue arm touch the blue arm? Uh, yeah, the colors have changed now. So the red represents the hydrophobic ones but the blue represents the hydrophilic. Actually, blue ones are positively charged, so they actually don't want to touch each other. They just want to be in water. So the, these, are, these snapshots are uh, taken at the air-water interface, so we are looking down. So that means the blue ones are actually trying to remain in water as much as possible, and also away from each other, in a sense. Only the uh, red ones are actually trying to touch each other. And if I look at the adsorption-free energy, 
Now, the red curve, as you'll remember, that was the bulk adsorption-free energy. So there was a deep minimum there. The, in bulk water, these molecules really attract each other and stick to each other. And then you cannot separate these molecules anymore. Whereas the green curve shows the uh, adsorption-free energy at the interface, we see that the interaction strength is greatly reduced there at the interface. So once again, we see the competition between this microscopic interface versus the nano interface between these molecules, how they actually play. And in bulk water, this is actually, uh, you can continue adding more and more molecules. For this particular molecule, the most stable structure is a tetramer, actually. So that four of these alpha helices come together and form a tetramer on their own. And that seems to be the most stable structure, as we understand from the uh, potential of new spheres. OK, so what do we learn from this? Um, we already talked about the macroscopic interfaces and what kind of major role do they play on the conformational behavior of these molecules. But in the second part, what I tried to convince you is we don't really need a macroscopic interface. In the cell environment, we have actually many molecules in there. It's not just a dilute water environment. I have many molecules. Maybe some of them are of the same type. Some of them are of different type. And these molecules, the presence of these molecules, actually present many nano interfaces to the conformation of the peptides or the proteins. So the take home message is, we, it is not, the, yes, the primary sequence, the, a makeup sequence of the amino acids is extremely important. Without knowing that, we cannot really tell much about the conformation of the molecules. But just on its own, that's not sufficient. But we also need to take into account the environment effects, such as the formation of uh, microscopic interfaces or the presence of other kinds of molecules. And one last thing, maybe, about stability versus flexibility. These, uh, peptides that I showed you were mostly uh, man-made synthetic uh, peptides. And what is similar, what is common about these are, it's just like the structures that we make in the microscopic world, so that when we make this table, for example, we, we don't want it to change its shape. We want it to remain as it is. But in nature, things don't work the same way. Uh, nature makes some proteins, but they are not permanently in a uh, one single conformation. They actually adopt many different conformations, but when they fold into the correct structure, they perform their task, and later on they again visit many other structures. Uh, in terms of learning the rules of the game, we still have a lot of uh, distance to cover. We have to learn how to make things uh, stable, but also flexible. So far, most of the things that we make are extremely stable so that they don't really behave like the ones in uh, nature. So we will hopefully uh, learn about that in the upcoming years. OK, I'm going to conclude by thanking you for listening. And also, the, the ones who actually make the work, these are the group members. The Jahid was uh, one of the major contributors to this work. And Beitullah and Özgür also contributed significantly to the work that I presented, and to my collaborators and the funding agencies. And thank you for listening, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Uh, not me, but my collaborators are conducting experiments. So I didn't talk about them, but uh, these design peptides can actually be used as materials. Uh, so the, the first example that I gave you, the, the ones that were used to, to create a network-like structure, for example, those were also synthesized by very similar peptides, uh, synthetic peptides. And yes, we do, uh, through our collaborations, we try to look at the behavior in real life as well. What is your definition of air? Is it empty space or do you actually put nitrogen? No, this is actually empty, empty space. space. Yes. And what is your definition of interface? Is it a third material or just the density change of water eventually? It's going mostly, into? well, in this case, uh, yes, of course the air water, uh, water molecules can vaporize and go into the air water interface, but throughout the simulation time that we can simulate, they don't really do that. 
but uh, in general, we put a slab of water molecules, and they are free. They, they, we don't really put any constraints on them. Uh, they can actually go towards the vacuum site, but throughout the simulation, you rarely see them going in there. Um, here, um, go back here. So would this help us in any way understanding the cause? Um, yes, so the hope is that um, the disease, Alzheimer's disease, is actually caused by uh, proteins that normally function in our brain cells uh, normally. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, they, let me try to open up that slide here. Okay. Uh, so they would have the secondary structure, but uh, throughout their life, they actually fold and unfold many times. But it just so happens that sometimes they misfold. And when they misfold, they, can, they become rather sticky, and they start sticking to each other and forming these fiber-like structures. Mm -hmm. So those fiber-like structures lead to the death of the neuronal cell. So the hope is that if I can understand why do these molecules behave like this, why do they form fibers, and hopefully if we can prevent them to form fibers, we can actually prevent, find a uh, solution to the Alzheimer's disease. Okay. And uh, the last point you made about stability and flexibility, uh, when you state that you know, in Alzheimer's disease they, they misfold, mm -hmm. so I understand that there's a way that cells are supposed to behave and, you know, something goes wrong. Yeah. Whereas at the end of your presentation, the point you made about nature, that, you know, things continue shifting and sometimes they perform their function. And mm -hmm. uh, so in nature, in the cell environment, many of the molecules are in a uh, marginal stable uh, situation mm -hmm. so that they they actually perform their function when they are folded, when they acquire this uh, tertiary structure. But many times, when they are on their own, they can actually fold and unfold on, the, on their own. Okay. And this is their normal function. But in the case of the Alzheimer's disease, what is not really known at this point is that they do aggregate among themselves, maybe aggregates of uh, 10 molecules or so. And this is also seen in healthy people, mm -hmm. and th there it doesn't seem to lead to any problems. But in the case of the patient, these aggregates, these small aggregates, seem to be actually growing in size. Mm -hmm. And they, when they grow oversized, when they become really fiber-like structures, then there co comes the problem. So we don't really understand what is the uh, triggering action there. Why do they grow uh, rather into uh, rather big structures? So if we can understand that, hopefully we can uh, find a better uh, cure. Uh, so your uh, basic uh, goal is to mimic the in vivo properties of I mean, biopolymers that are inside of white. Um, mimicking the in vivo properties is definitely out of my reach. Yeah, I cannot do that. Because as I said, the cell environment is very crowded. You have many different molecules in there. It's a soup-like structure. So mimicking that structure is really beyond our, the scope. And I don't really want to do that, on the other hand. Because I, what I would like to do is I'd like to still simplify the problem, but I just want to ask the following question. What are the really important factors? So for a long time, this protein folding problem, uh, people working on this said that, well, I, if I know the sequence, and by knowing the sequence, if I can predict the tertiary structure of proteins, then the problem is solved, and I can uh, solve every single problem. But what I'm trying to show, or not just me, but other people are also, is that it's not just a single molecule that you have to take into account. Yes, the primary sequence, uh, which letters that amino acid uh, that peptide is made out of, is very important. But in addition to that, you also have to take into account the environmental factors. This can be temperature. Or this can be like the, the, the way I'm studying it, it can be an interface. So, uh, so it's just eliminating lots of parameters? And yeah, trying to simplify the problem as much as possible. But uh, what I'm arguing is that uh, just 
simplifying the pro uh, problem to the level of just the sequence is not a really good answer. You, you cannot really predict all of the material properties there. So you, know, you have to take into account the environmental factors. Uh, and it's just to, not just the interfaces. You have to also take into account, for example, pH changes or how much salt is in there uh, or the temperature, for example. But I mean, the thing that is in my mind is why did you choose air as um, as the interface? I mean, what, you you wanted to check the hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity, maybe. Yes. So the motivation there was when, uh, in the case of the Alzheimer's disease, the way these molecules, these peptides, stick to each other is because these peptides, these molecules themselves, also have. Uh, parts of the molecule that are hydrophobic and parts of the molecule that are hydrophilic. So if, I, if you consider it like that, then you can maybe think of, well, there are actually lots of interfaces there on the molecule. So the air-water interface is actually uh, kind of an other simplification in that case. So first I want to study, well, if I present it with just a single macroscopic interface, which again, with the hope that I mimic the interaction between the molecules, of course. So the air-water interface is just another example of uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, which derives the separation of the hydrophobic and hydrophilic residues. Okay, so thanks for listening. Thank you.